the stars of animation are shining. It's time to stay tuned. And now, here's your host, Phil Mackey. Good evening, and welcome to this extra spooky edition of Stay Tuned. <coughs> Halloween is right around the corner, and what better way to usher in the holiday than with an equally creepy cartoon? Tonight's special guest is Maxwell Adams. He's had his hand in a multitude of scary cartoons over the years, but Maxwell Adams is probably still best known for creating Grim and Evil for Cartoon Network back in the early 2000s. This series was made up of two very different, but still equally macabre, cartoons known as Evil Con Carne and The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, the latter of which received over 80 episodes and three TV movies. In addition to his writing credits for both script and story, having written, produced, and directed episodes for the series Banicula and Disney's Fish Hooks, Maxwell Adams has been known to get behind the microphone providing his voice for various characters. We're about to meet the man behind the Reaper in just a few moments. But first, this. Maxwell Adams, welcome to Stay Tuned. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> well, it is my welcome pleasure to welcome you. <laughs> welcome to October, the spookiest part of the year. October. Woo! <laughs> yeah, 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 I like the ghost sound. It matches your skull hat. Oh, yes. Yes, it does. I've got a lot of skull stuff, it turns out. Ah, uh, see, I'm also a big skeleton skull guy. What, but what's the history behind that hat, out of, out of curiosity? Uh, I just thought it was this big, dumb skull hat with a, a glittery rhinestone thing that I would wear maybe once and get a laugh out of. But it turns out I kind of like it. <laughs> <laughs> you were correct. It is a skull with rhinestones around it. That is a very <laughs> accurate thought that you had. So like many artists, you've been known to wear multiple hats. Appropriately enough, I just asked you about your hat. That wasn't even a, a planned thought there. But in terms of writing, when someone gets a story credit versus a written by credit, can you explain that distinction? Uh, sure. Story is usually uh, sort of the idea of the story. So it could be uh, just a premise or an outline that somebody writes. And uh, generally, that's what uh, Billy and Mandy was. It was a premise driven show. And then shows like, Batman, the animated series, would be a script-driven show, and those people would get written by credit. So you wouldn't typically have a story credit and a written by credit for two different people on the same episode? Uh, it's pretty common to have story and written by, uh, but you could, it's not very common. No, I guess you could go either way. <laughs> Perfect. You could go either way, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember Grim and Evil showing up on Cartoon Network as a short presentation before the series came around. So how did it evolve from there into two separate shows? Uh, it was sort of strange. Uh, I came out to Los Angeles and just started pitching shows without really knowing anything about the process. I was just like, this is what I want to do. And so I pitched, I don't know how many by the time I got to Cartoon Network. And I guess long story short, Billy and Mandy was based on a film I did in college. Uh, and I had actually worked those two characters into another pitch uh, that I was trying to sell called Milkman, about a hero uh, who was also a milk carton, and he'd find missing kids by looking on the back of his head, which is a joke that makes no sense in, in modern time. <laughs> the carton work looked at it, and they were like, oh, hey, we like these kids, so uh, you know, show us something with these kids. Uh, so I got them Billy and Mandy, and as I was making that pilot, uh, uh, animation is very seasonal, so it takes you know three, five months to... Uh, get anything done and then you you send it away overseas to actually be animated and it can be there for another six or seven months before it comes back so when i had this open you know period of time cartoon network was like well do you have anything else you want to do in the meantime do you want to want to do another pilot so uh, i was making my pilots uh, at the same time as uh, greg miller who did uh, 
Whatever Happened to Robot Jones and Tom Warburton, who did uh, Kenny and the Chimp and Kids Next Door. Right. So we all sort of rolled onto our second pilots together, and, and mine was Evil Can Carne. And uh, so finally, when, when the Big Tick weekend came around and uh, everybody had to vote on what the next series was, uh, Billy and Mandy won. But the sort of standard at the time for Cartoon Network was that you had a middle cartoon. Cartoons were seven minutes long, so you had three and a half hour, and two were supposed to be your main show, and then uh, the one in the middle would be something else. So Dexter's Lab had its Dial M for Monkey, and uh, Justice Friends, uh, and ours was Evil Concarne. So that's kind of where Dream and Evil came from. And uh, I guess after the second or third season, we were just... Uh, it was just like a lot of work because both cartoons were, were sort of completely different shows. Right. So Cartoon Network was like, well, hey, we're impartial in this, but pick one to continue and the other one can, can go away. And I was like, well, I'd love to finish out a season of Evil Concarne, but, uh, you know, clearly Billy and Mandy is my, my favorite. So if I have to choose, that's what I'm going to go with. Uh, and they were really great about that, really accommodating. We did get to uh, do a, a second season in quotes of Evil Concarne, which was really just finishing out the... Uh, full order of, of one season of 13 episodes. And I guess that's how, that's how it was born and how it died. That's cool. You know, it's weird hearing you describe that now. I get why they said, you know, have this show, have a middle show. But as a young person watching Cartoon Network, I remember being very confused. Like, why is, what is this? Why is there this? And then this other little thing. And then this, I don't know that it translated to the audience the same way that they're, you know what I mean? The way that they were kind of processing it out. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I forgot to mention, I guess, I guess part of it came from just the fact that as we kept going with the stories, you know, we, we had the desire to tell longer stories, and that would have meant splitting the, the series down the middle, which we couldn't do. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Billy and Mandy was yeah, clearly the, the favorite. I mean, I think you made the right choice there. Aw, you stained your dress. It's not a dress. Now give me the hamster. No. No? Well, why not? I'll make you a deal. We will play a game with you. If you win, you can have Mr. Snuggles. Ooh, ooh, can he have me mm -hmm. too? Yes, and if we win, we keep Mr. Snuggles. <laughs> I love games, and I never lose. Neither do I. So where did, like when you were conceptualizing Grim and Evil as two separate shows, where did those ideas even come from? Uh, like I said, Billy and Mandy was, it sort of spun from this college film I'd made and, and the characters of Billy and Mandy had kind of been around in some form or other through most of my young life. Okay. And I'd always been into monsters and, you know, the occult and skeletons and weirdness. So uh, when I was developing a show for just those two, the, uh, the third party, because I felt like it needed somebody else in there to kind of balance out the extremes of Billy and Mandy uh, was actually the devil. And the show had a whole different name. And uh, wow. since I worked on Cartoon Network on Cow and Chicken, they already had a devil. And I knew that yes. even though they, they hated the devil, like they just hated that the devil was the devil. And because it was a devil with a big butt, it was just like a double no-no. And I was like, I'm never going to get a devil through. Uh, so Which like, is well, weird because they had two, they actually had two different shows that had a devil in it. They had Oh yeah, yeah Powerpuff as well. Powerpuff Girls, right. Sort of yeah, that's very were, weird. Were smart enough not to call him the devil and make him look like a classic devil, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, so in my wisdom, I was like, oh, they don't want the devil, so Grim Reaper, they'll love it. Uh, and I, really looking back, there's, I have no idea how that got through. There's, it makes no sense to me, but I'm, I'm glad it happened. And why he has a Jamaican accent as well? Uh, yeah, that I owe to Greg Eagles, because my original plan was to have Grim sound like uh, Dr. Smith from Lost in Space, kind of just sort of a British uh, uptight guy. And we actually had Dr. Smith come in and, and he was lovely. But when Greg Eagles got in there, uh, he was just messing around in the booth and doing uh, his seven up guy impression. And I was like, that's it. <laughs> that's the one. Oh, that's great. That's great. So it was a happy accident. Yes, absolutely. Uh, some of the best things are. Yeah. And uh, to finish the, uh, the rest of your, your question. Uh, yeah. Uh, Evil Concarne was, was sort of uh, I guess everything I was doing at the time was sort of a love letter to my childhood and cartoons I loved as a kid. Uh, so Billy and Mandy took, took care of sort of the, the Hanna-Barbera, Warner Brothers, you know, comedy half. And then the other stuff I loved was like all action stuff like G.I. Joe and stuff that I admit uh, that plot is, is awful, but I still love very much. And uh, well, the character, Evil design, the character design on Evil Concarne is just, I mean, wow. 
<laughs> he's a brain, yes. Yeah. And he's in a jar, and that jar is housed in the body of a bear, correct? It was a complex relationship. <laughs> Very. <laughs> Just to get across on screen. Almost a, almost a Krang from Turtles kind of a thing. Yeah, except uh, a Krang with a, or well, a, a body with a little bit more of, of a will of its own, I guess. Right. So, so you're making it sound like you didn't have a ton of experience before, you know, creating a series. Is that right? Oh, God, no. I was 23. <laughs> I had, uh, I moved to LA in 1998 and uh, I got an internship at Film Roman. I uh, started on the Twisted Tales of Felix the Cat. Ah, uh, it's one of that. my favorite shows of all time, by the way. Oh, cool. Yeah, was, I was on the second season, which I don't think it aired in the US, at least not for a while. Yeah, I don't know that that was ever even released as on DVD. Yeah, it was it was fantastic for me because at the time uh, the show was sort of dead on arrival. Like uh, I, I got there and there was a crew of four people and there was just a ton of stuff to do and you know I was I was eager to do literally anything and everybody was else else was so burnt out they were just like yeah go ahead you want to do backgrounds go ahead you want to do storyboards go for it man. <laughs> That's, so that's kind of sad because it, I feel like that show was breaking some ground and it, and it just like no one noticed. Yeah, that, I mean, that happens a lot in animation. There's a lot of good stuff that just sort of falls through the cracks. Ah, man, I, I love that show. What we got here is a missing background. The people who paint the backgrounds for this cartoon didn't finish this one. Hello? Hey, background people! Could we have a background for this scene, huh? Please? A background department, are you out there? Hey, try it in Korean. Once the success of a series is under your belt, does that provide you with a sort of free pass to put another concept out there? Or are you still subject to the same scrutiny as an unknown who pitches an idea? Uh, I'm sure I have a, a leg up to some degree on that, but it really is a, it's a weird, weird business. And... and it really depends on, you know, your relationship with other people and, you know, who, who the people are you're pitching to and what they're looking for. And it almost just has to be this magic combination of, of finding the right person that happens to be looking for, you know, exactly what you have. And I think in Hollywood, there's also, even at, at the animation level, there's sort of a, a vibe of like, you know, well, you, you did that, but like, what are you doing for me now? It is sort of a, a thing where you have to reprove yourself again and again and, it still annoys me a little bit, but I'm used to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting used to it, I, I, I'm sure it would help, but it also sounds like it, it could be incredibly frustrating. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Yeah, you know, it also seems like many cartoon creators wind up providing at least one character voice at some point. So, how did you wind up as Jeff the Spider? Basically, because I am Jeff, or, or at least at that time, that was that was the joke was that uh, you know Jeff was just this like too nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of like at least how I, f I felt about myself at the time that I was just sort of, uh, I guess, being sort of passive aggressively nice. I think there's a little bit of that in there. Okay. But also, uh, you know, it was, uh, I have this thing where I like to uh, challenge myself and, and sometimes scare myself. And I, I really, uh, I'm better at it now, but I, I was so not about public speaking or, or even really being social when I started out. And that's, especially to manage something, like you have to get over that stuff and just uh, be able to communicate with people. And, and same with the, the voices. I was like, ah, oh, this kind of scares me, but I'm going to try it. So uh, I got in there and did it. And, and the first couple of recordings genuinely do sound pretty awful, but I think I did get better. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a female spider who has a very average, nice guy sounding voice. Yes. <laughs> Uh, do you do you do you remember where where that where that idea was spawned? Uh, it really just came out of uh, the outline and the, and the idea of uh, sort of in the moment of like hey we need more shows so generally when a season would start I'd write a whole bunch of outlines and there's some that I would be like well this is one that I definitely want to do myself and so that was one of the ones was like oh well Billy sits on a a giant egg like a classic cartoon caper only instead of a you know, a chicken or whatever. It's just a, it's a giant Lovecraftian hell spider that he, you know, thinks it's his dad. <laughs> so I set that aside and I was like, this is, this is the one I'm going to do. And by the time I was done, I was like, I'm going to, you know, stack on the voice and, and see what happens. So you kind of, you kind of uh, felt some affinity for the spiders. That, that says, yeah. 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 That, that, that can happen for sure. Dad. <laughs> oh, I didn't scare you. Did I? Die, evil spider. <laughs> 
Aw, oh, Dad, this is just like old times. Hey, Dad! Get away! I've got some really big news to tell you. Gotta go to my heavy base! Gotta go to I've my heavy base! I've just laid thousands and thousands base. of eggs. Do you know what that means? <laughs> yep, you're gonna be a grandpa! But, but, that's impossible! You're a boy spider! You know, that's what I thought too. Until I had these! <laughs> You wrote episodes for the show, but obviously there are other writers in animation who are responsible for their own episodes. What can you tell me about the challenges surrounding feelings of protectiveness? Uh, I struggle with it. Uh, Billy and Mandy was one of the best uh, experiences of, of my career and of my life. And it was very, very uh, open. It was, it was just a really collaborative, creative environment. and. You know, I, d I did write a lot of the, the outlines and sort of the seeds of stories, uh, but the, the board artists, you know, I, there's really only so much you can do yourself on a series because there's just so much happening so quickly. So when you can find people that can fill in and do, you know, take anything off your plate and, and you can trust them to do it, it's amazing. So by the time we got, you know, halfway through Billy and Mandy, I had this incredible, you know, creative crew who could do this stuff. So, uh, you know, I would encourage them to write as many outlines as they wanted and, uh, Sometimes we'd even end up with extras that would roll into the next season, but a lot of the time people would write their own stuff and then board their own stuff as well. Oh, they board their own stuff. That's yeah, a, yeah. That's not common. We only had, uh, we had a, a writer who was a friend of mine uh, that I worked in on some video games with uh, in college, and he was our, our first season writer. He's where Spurg came from. He had a friend named Spurg in, uh, in elementary school, and eventually he moved back to Canada, and after that we sort of just went completely uh, sort of internal premises for the most part. It's not normal for a writer to board their own story, is it? Uh, it's not so normal anymore. There's shows uh, that are kind of built around that. I mean, back in like Looney Tunes times, that's kind of the way it was done. And there was, uh, there was a resurgence of that in the early 90s. And uh, shows like Billy and Mandy and Chowder uh, were sort of at the tail end of that. Well, Chowder is a fantastic show as well. Yeah, I had fun briefly working on that. More with Maxwell Adams after this. Due to a flaw in evolution, people's skulls are actually too confining for their brains. This causes great reduction in the brain's potential. To relieve this pressure, a small hole can be drilled into the skull. Wow! Nifty. Can I try? You know, I do feel different. Kind of lightheaded. You've mentioned your college film a couple times. Is that something that people can still see? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's on YouTube on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's, the quality is super poor. I didn't want to paint cells, so I did it paper cut out with markers that I cut out with scissors and taped on the cells and shot that on a World War II era Bolex camera and the film just sat in my closet for a decade and a half until uh, I had it transferred to video and then eventually transferred to DVD and then ripped to digital. So that's what you're watching. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Copy of a copy of a copy. Yes, exactly. Can we talk about Has Been Hotel? Uh, sure. Like I, I don't I can't give you a lot of, of information. <laughs> sure. Seeing as how it's, uh, you know, being released October. October. Which is where we are. <laughs> yeah. So it, how did you get involved with that? And, and how, how involved are you? Uh, I'm, I really only came in and uh, did some voices. And, and that's about it. Uh, I've known Vivian digitally for, for years. And one day she just wrote and was like, hey, do you want to do a voice on this thing? And I was like, yeah. Uh, we met at a recording studio and I actually got to do a couple. It was a, it was a lot of fun. And it's an independent project, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sh yeah, she's been doing uh, just beautiful artwork for years. So, uh, you know, I've, I've had her on my, you know, follow and just seen her stuff go by. And So I've been thinking, isn't there a more humane way to hinder overpopulation here in hell? Perhaps we can create an alternative way to change souls through... Redemption? 
Well, I think yes. So that's what this project aims to achieve. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm opening the first of its kind. A hotel that rehabilitates sinners. <laughs> well, it seems like it's right up your alley. I mean, the, the theme yeah, was... of the show is, I mean, obviously it takes place in hell. Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's right in line with everything we've been talking about so far. Mm -hmm. So let's do well, October. Yes. October. Speaking of things that are grim, let's talk dead meat. All right. Now, this is a bit of a diversion from animation, obviously, but, you know, it's, it involves puppetry, and I'm sure many of the skills that you uh, honed while you were working at Cartoon Network have transferred very well into this project, right? Uh, yeah, actually, it ended up being much more about animation than I ever wanted. <laughs> oh, well, do tell. Yeah, it's, it's essentially live action, but there's so much uh, sort of special effects stuff uh, that I have to do to almost everything that animation gets incorporated into almost all of it because there's, you know, moving uh, puppets on top of model moving cars. And, you know, I have to composite all that together and sort of make it look plausible. I was hoping it would get me out from behind the desk, but really I, I just sit behind a computer all day long. <laughs> I understand. So this is a series that you're independently producing, right? Uh, yeah, essentially, I, it's, it's always been uh, about 90 minutes of content. So I'm not sure if I'm going to trickle it out as a series now or just release it in one movie-sized chunk. But it's getting, getting closer. Now that it's October. 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 Uh, I'm probably way further than I was in the summer. <laughs> Well, that's good. What's the expect expected release date of this series? Or uh, what I've realized, sadly, is that I, I have a really hard time predicting that just because uh, I've got a very long dead meat story. It's had a lot of hardships, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm keeping on, keeping on. And, and basically what I've realized over time is like I can't quit my job because I need, you know, money to live and money to finish this thing. So I have to have a job and having the job means I'm sort of um, burning the candle at every end of yeah the schedule so uh if everything goes smoothly you know i can get a lot done and then if something goes wrong at work it may mean i have to deal with that first and the work job you're referring to is writing scripts and things uh yeah yeah uh writing drawing the management the usual business okay very cool what anything currently you can talk about with that that you're working on i don't think so yet a year from now october <laughs> October. October. Another thing coming in October that's very, very October-y. <laughs> oh, man. And involves mystery. I think oh. I can... oh, I like that. We'll just leave that mystery word floating yeah. in the ether. Well, awesome. And, and so is the thought that once the 90 minutes of content is out there, that that will become like a pitch to someone else or just that you'll be able to be fully funded to make more of Dead Meat? The goal right now is mostly to get the trailer done, and I actually am pretty close on that. Great. And once the trailer's done, I will... Uh, originally, I didn't want to, you know, bring it to, to any studio, and I just wanted to kind of do it myself, but I'm, you know, I do want to finish it in my lifetime, so if I can get some help, uh, help doing that, I'm all about it. That's great. I, I derailed myself. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's fine. I, I do it constantly. The best way for people to support Maxwell Adams right now would be to do fill in the blank. Uh, just, you know, send me a message telling me to keep on trucking. I, I have this weird thing where uh, I feel like I have to fulfill the promise of the initial Kickstarter before I can ask for money from, you know, regular people. If Netflix or whoever wants to, to do this thing, then I'm all about it. But uh, yeah, I, I don't feel like I can do, uh, you know, another Kickstarter or, uh, you know, Patreon or anything until I, I fulfill some of the stuff that I feel like I am negligent on. So the, yeah, so the, there, there was a very successful Kickstarter that you ran, right? I mean, it was, it was. I got enough more than what I asked for that uh, by the time Amazon took their cut, I got exactly what I asked for, which is fantastic. I did know that wasn't going to be enough to do the whole thing, so I sort of, uh, I've probably put in, I don't know, a, a lot myself <laughs> just to get it done. Yeah, you know, and and uh, I guess it is what it is so far. Uh, I, I'm still really passionate about it. I think it's going to look like. A million bucks in cost, nowhere near that. Hopefully it'll still be timely when it comes out. And uh, as far as, uh, you know, anything beyond the initial movie, 
because I've been with it so long, I have thought, uh, well, okay, yeah, it's a trilogy because uh, there's the first one and then there's, in, in my mind, there's the second one that's uh, called Dark Meat and a third one that's called Street Meat. And, you know, they each have their own sort of uh, take on this world, but uh, and the what's, second could theoretically be a, a TV series if, if someone wanted it. Okay. What's the general story around, or are we not allowed to know that yet? Uh, no, I mean, Dead Meat itself, it's, it's a post-apocalyptic uh, puppet action movie. And uh, it just takes place in this sort of blasted wasteland that uh, once was Los Angeles. And it's about a, a mutant hunter and his, his mutant dog that he has to hide from the world and uh, this other mutant woman that sort of comes between them. So on a very simple level, it's a, it's a love triangle with lots of mutants and blood and weird stuff. It sounds fantastic. It sounds right up your alley as well. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Inspired by the Thunderbirds at all? Uh, you know what? I never really watched the Thunderbirds much when I was a kid. I mean, I, I've seen some now. These are more sort of uh, Jim Henson Muppety puppets than marionettes. Yeah, and you know, there was actually a little bit of that in Chowder, wasn't there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Carl, uh, Carl had a lot of puppets going on uh, in the uh, end tags, I think. Yeah. Were you involved in making those? Uh, no, we did have some puppets uh, in a couple of the Billy and Mandy's. I think that's probably where my what reignited my uh, love of puppets was. Uh, during Billy and Mandy's Big Boogie Adventure, I decided it would be fun because we had a, an episode with a hostile gato puppet. If I had got the main characters, uh, you know, they just go into this other dimension uh, in the underworld for 15 seconds where they're puppets. And the joke is they realize they're puppets and uh, Billy pulls up his shirt and there's like a human arm underneath and he freaks out. Uh, and it was a good joke. And then, uh, you know, I, I did it and we got the puppets made and we shot it. And then I remember the general manager of Cartoon Network coming in and being like, this was the most expensive 15 seconds we've ever done. <laughs> oh, wow. It seems like that, that, that's a trend in cartoons, too. There's a few shows like, uh, like SpongeBob has done that, where they go, they go off and it's like the real world or something like that. A lot yeah. of breaking down the fourth wall sort of thing. Yeah, I, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunity, especially now when, you know, you don't have to draw everything on cells. There's a lot of opportunities to sort of bring in other surprising elements. I guess that's, you know, all of Gumball. Yeah. Oh, you mean the Amazing World of Gumball? Yeah. Yeah. Did, were you involved in that at all? No, no. Uh, I, I've seen a bunch. Well, not a bunch, but a, enough to know it's a, it's a funny show. And yeah. I know it also takes them a long time to make. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it looks like it takes them long. It looks like it would be very time consuming. Yeah. Well, anyway, well, Maxwell, this has, been, uh, this has been a really cool conversation. I, I, I know you're a busy guy and I appreciate you taking a little bit of time to, you know, tell us your backstory and best of luck with red meat. Hey, no problem. Or dead. I'm sorry with dead meat. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I'll, I'll do, I'll do that one too. Yeah. Red meat is a comic strip by a guy named, uh, also named Max. Oh, Hey, well, there you go. Yeah. Crust uh, synapses in the brain. Ta-da! I'm the Grim Reaper. <laughs> Grim, I'm going to borrow your sight for tonight. Okay. Just be careful. You twerp. I'll be super careful. What did I tell you about my scythe? Not to pick my nose with it. And he who wields the power of the scythe could open the vortex to the underworld, unleash unspeakable chaos, and end the world as we know it. Well, actually, yes. Any plans for a Billy and Mandy Blu-ray? Uh, if there are, I'm unaware. I'm sort of out of the Billy and Mandy business. Uh, Cartoon Network owns it. And uh, they will do what they please. Does that kind of suck? Yeah, it's, it's weird in a way. Like I, I go to Comic-Con and there's, you know, people that sell, uh, you know, Billy and Mandy fan art. And I feel like if I did that, I'd get busted. <laughs> so it's a little, it's a little odd. Yeah. See, somehow you selling fan art of, of a thing you created that you no longer own is somehow more legit than them doing it. Yeah, but I still think I'd get in more trouble. <laughs> Probably, yes. The accountability would be there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. cool. Did I ask you for a, web, a website or is there a website you wanted promoted? Uh, at this point, I guess I'm just funneling everything toward my Facebook because I don't really know what else to do. So Not towards YouTube? Uh, oh, yeah, there's really not a lot on YouTube. I feel like if there's probably more to see. Uh, I'm, I'm working toward getting more videos, but at this point, it's mostly photos. So Okay. So for people to, to come check out your work, check you out on Facebook. Yeah. That's that's where it's at. Okay, well that's In fair. <laughs> What's that? What was that? That's where it's at as of October. 
As of October. October. Yeah. October. October. Well, take care, Max. Well. All right. You too, Phil. Yeah. Thanks again for being here. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Phil. was the opening theme to the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy. Credit for the series theme goes to Gregory Hind and Drew Newman, with the majority of its episodic music provided by both composers, along with occasional work by Guy Moon. Drew Newman had previously composed most of the signature sounds from Nickelodeon's Ah! Real Monsters, and has since done work for Benicula. The only thing scary now is that this episode has come to an end. Special thanks go out once again to Maxwell Adams for joining us here on the show. Of course, thank you so much for listening in at home. If you love Stay Tuned, go behind the podcast by visiting patreon.com forward slash filmaki. Subscribing there will get you access to cool rewards like exclusive interview outtakes, my cartoon reviews, and monthly video updates. I'm also inviting you to check out my original comic books at RetailSunshine.com. And be sure to say hi to me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook under the handles of both Retail Sunshine and Phil Maki. Don't forget to visit the ever-growing Stay Tuned community on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Stay Tuners. I've been Phil Maki, you've been a wonderful audience, and until next time, keep those eyeballs peeled, those ears open, and be sure to stay tuned. <laughs>